Please welcome Vikas Khanna. Hi. Nice to have you at Google. Thank you for coming in. My honor. Pleasure. Hi, everyone. So thanks for coming in. You are Google New York's favorite chef, one of the favorite chefs up here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> tag. This is also a tag. <laughs> I, I, I bet, yeah, right? <laughs> I'm so proud to be here. It's, this is my third time here, I guess. Yeah. But two times I was just cooking food for everyone. And both the times it happened to be Diwali, which is the big Indian festival. So I'm proud that to bring a piece of homeland to America. Nice. Yeah, so uh, we also have food today from your uh, yeah. book. It's in Hemisphere up to 2 p.m., so go eat that. <laughs> um, so uh, you've been in New York for how many years? Like uh, more than? I came here in 2000, December 2nd. Count how many years? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the best person for that. <laughs> but it's almost oh, wow. 16 years, 15 years. Do you call yourself a New Yorker? Like, do you, do you look at New York as home? or? Is oh. it, uh, I was reading this uh, British, some philosopher who said that, you know, we are born out of darkness and we come to the world. Same thing happened to me when I got off number seven train when she came out of the tunnel. So I felt exactly the same. I, everyone remembers coming to New York City, the first stop, the moment they came up, the first sidewalk, the first building they saw. It, it's, it's so real. It's like, you know. Right. It's like you're here finally. Yeah, you made it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice, yeah. Uh, so your new book, yes. uh, classic and contemporary <clears throat> Indian dishes, Indian harvest. Uh, so uh, tell us something about why you have a vegetarian book. You know, it's all it's all vegetarian dishes, right? This is all vegetarian dishes. It's a it's a book by Bloomsbury USA, and I'm very proud for this association. I think um, even the name is very beautiful. It's about harvest one of the most essentials of our life. It's something of gratitude, it's something about, something about humanity in that word harvest. I think something very powerful. And many of the tribal to urban to suburban festivals are always based on harvest. So we suggested that we should call it harvest as a word gratitude. So it's vegetarian because I thought that there's such a large market now, there's so much of awareness of vegetarian food. There's, um, I wouldn't say that it's a fad, it's here to stay. And it's great that I, being an Indian and being an Indian chef, that vegetarian is not like something which you are like, you know. I remember when we had eggs for the first time in our home, we didn't eat it. Our grandmother wouldn't let us eat. She said, think about the hens. And I'm like, really, why? It's like, you stole somebody's baby. It's like, I remember it's like 1980 something. It's like, so true in a way. but. We never had, till I was 17, I went to college and I had started enjoying and understanding seafood and everything. Because I come from, it's only fried fish sometimes, if you're rich and you've saved money on the first Sunday of the month. But this is a fantastic opportunity to talk about a culture through food. Yeah, there's certainly. That's why this is. Yeah, seeing this perception of uh, vegetarian being like a substitute, uh, like in, especially in some Western culture, it's like, I think. We, Books like yours go a long way in correcting that. But it's good that we can talk about something different. Yeah. It's like not just giving the market what they want to consume. It is also giving something which matters, is something which is essential, and something you believe in. And there's a dedication page says it all. I'm not a vegetarian at all, but <laughs> <laughs> I eat everything. I, I, there's a page here which says, dedicated to all my gurus who taught me how to cook and roll breads. And most important, they were all vegetarian. They truly showed me the power of food and love. So this first page itself is like, it's for me, this is not just a book. It's a dedication to all those wrinkled hands, what I say, who stood by me and kept no secret from me in the kitchen. And without even knowing that eventually, you will be running Janoon in New York. They did not. It's a big leap from where I come from. <laughs> Yeah, certainly. Speaking of Janoon, right? Congratulations on winning your fifth Michelin star, right? Yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's great to be in that category, right? Uh, like, uh, there are too many great restaurants and too many great Indian chefs in the world. I'm I'm proud to be part of the fraternity. Nice. So, what does it take to 
earn a Michelin star and keep it for five years and hopefully more. <laughs> it's like uh, it's something which is very strange that, you know, uh, in 1990, when I joined college, my principal or the people who gave me admission said, we will give you admission on a condition that you're going to learn English, which I actually failed in the first semester. <laughs> and I think they forgot about that condition and they <laughs> let me go in the college. But I read this magazine which talked about Michelin stars. This is the first time I heard of a Michelin star. I had no idea about a Michelin tire also then. <laughs> that <time it's> like <laughs> yeah. But I said, and the last line said that, you know, this is the glorified kitchens of the world, earn a Michelin star and everything, and said, unfortunately, India, even with such large population love for food, uh, a chef would not be able to get it. And I, I think that was a very powerful last line about someone telling a child who's starting off in the industry and saying that, you will be exempt from the glory. And it was like, a, for me, it was like a very big, that line was struck with me forever. I said, once in my lifetime, I'm going to get it. And they call you, you know, they call yeah. you in the afternoon. It, it's very difficult. I, I won't, would not be able to explain properly in English. If you're talking Punjabi, I can explain it right and left <laughs> what I was feeling that time. <laughs> so they call you around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and they, they pick up the phone, and they say, yes, I'm calling from the Michelin Guide. We just want to... And I'm like, <laughs> I was so numb. I didn't understand that. Did I win it or did I not win it? First time. So everybody's asking me, standing there, Chef, what? I said, I didn't understand what she was saying. I was like, <laughs> did you get it or not? <laughs> but this is like when the Twitter was not like, you know, every, now yeah. it, you can see the list right away. But we got it. It was, I think no one should be exempt from experimenting with their life. It's nice that you take on that challenge and. It's like, uh, that movie is really inspired me. It's like funny to talk about a, a rat at this stage. But Ratatouille yeah. really inspired me. And that line about that a great artist can come from anywhere. That's true. Can come from anywhere. But I also feel that uh, coming from humble backgrounds, it's, it's an amazing uh, uh, hunger. And you have 24 hours. And you don't take a day for granted. Because you don't know that this must be something which is greater than you. It's inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> so the menu at Junoon, right? Yeah. How is that? Uh, is that like completely? Did Did you think about like <coughs> creating a completely Indian menu, or is this like sort of geared towards the Western palate? And it's as pure. Uh, I think it's almost nine years, nine or ten years ago when I first met Mr. Rajesh Bharadwaj. He's the. I always say that he is the main brain, and uh, I happen to be on the journey. And it's fantastic when we first talk about Indian food. And he kept telling one thing, which was he was so, it was a very powerful message what he wanted to give the world, that we want to have a, a fine dining restaurant which serves Indian food, not just an Indian restaurant. We want to give an experience that um, the moment you walk into a restaurant, that you feel that this is like the gravity of Indian culture, cuisine, flavors. So the, you have to be pure in your flavors. But you should also be evolving. It, sh it should always be evolving. There should always be something new in your plate every time you come in. There should always be something new to be offered. Because that is what, is what New York is about. If you have to survive here, you've got to be re reinventive all the time. So it's, it's cuisine, which is totally Indian mm -hmm. from the soul. But you might feel that it has been presented in absolutely new norms and new faces. Nice. Have you considered doing some like something like Punjabi Dhaba upscale restaurant, you know? Dhaba means a small kiosk and you know I've been running it since I was seventeen. I, it's really interesting that my father used to say don't call it a business, call it a charity. Because if somebody will come to eat our food, my father used to say don't call it a business, call it a charity. Because if somebody will come to eat our food, we'll be so happy, we'll give them for free. <laughs> and when somebody would complain, we won't charge it. My dad will always be like, when are you going to learn how to make money? It's like, uh, I said, you know, as long as my grandmother would always stand by me. And she said, as long as he's happy in what he does, it does not make any difference otherwise. And I, I love that. It stuck with me that <laughs> my first job was, of course, as an apprentice in a kitchen. But it was also my first business was running a mm -hmm. taba in the backside of my house, in a very narrow lane where only one car can come. 
But uh, we did the best what we could do in our ability of making three, four dishes which I knew how to cook, that's all. And charging 20 rupees. And Punjabi people can really eat. It was all <laughs> you can eat. So it was always like... <laughs> 20 oh, rupees was 10. 20 yeah. rupees, like how much? Yeah. yeah. Like 40 cents. 30 cents, sorry, yeah. 40 cents. So it was like amazing that you'll have people who'll say, oh, you know what, I, I didn't enjoy the food so much. I couldn't eat much. And can you just pack the rest for me? It's like, <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> but it was a great training ground. People discount the fact that starting small is something that I'm telling you, even the next glorified Indian chef or anyone who will get the Michelin star will come from a very similar background and belief. That it was that little thing you learned right. while you were doing the smallest of jobs. I still don't forget my first tandoor I bought. He bought 24 plates, white plates. We got 23 chairs. So it was crazy when we have more than 24 people to cook for. We'll have to go back and wash the plate and bring it back. <laughs> so I'm just waiting for somebody to finish fast, man. <laughs> That is the most important training ground. Most important training ground is to start. Invaluable lessons there. Oh, how much you learn from there. And the kitchen was not covered. We didn't have resources to cover the kitchen. So every time it would rain, it says like. <laughs> we, oh, by you, cover, you mean a physical cover? There was no sh shade. <laughs> <laughs> OK. But the sh what do you call it? Roof. Roof. Oh, yeah. There was no roof on the kitchen. So every time it would rain, people find it very, how can you have a kitchen? Like, yeah, the kitchen was never covered for the first few years. And the worst was when you had to make the breads in the tandoor and it began to rain. It's very clear visual. <laughs> in the book, I write about some stories that my, my mother or grandmother would stand with an umbrella near the tandoor and they will protect me <laughs> from making the breads. And, and so many times you'll feel, that, and she'll say to my grandmother also, save your face. Save your face. It's like, OK, I need to go inside the tandoor to get the bread out. No, take it out from far. Save your face. Like she'll always be worried about that. That keeps you going. Yeah. That keeps you going. That's the real you. Nice. So uh, at Junoon, right, there's a speciality spice room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, for me, that's like the thing that stood out in memory yeah. from my visit there. It's. It's, it's a spice room. When you go down in the restaurant, there's a spice lounge and there's a spice room. You'll see so many spices, but now I've become a little bit more normal. I've, I've become more empathetic. I learned that. I've become more empathetic to people's reaction towards telling them, I have a 1,000 spices. You, you freak people out. <laughs> so now we have, little, we have more on display work, a lot of spices. We buy from all over the world. And my latest research, which is going to come a few years from now, will be about the, how the spices actually grow from the flower stage to the stage in which we consume. So the spice room is it's, it's the essential. It is the soul of Indian food. And to have a masala room. Yeah. You know, a, and I feel that sometimes you have so many people who just come for the, just to see the spice room. And you show them how you grind spices. And it's like, you know, it's like life cannot be just black pepper and salt. <laughs> There's definitely more to that. <laughs> but it's also super interesting when you have a lot of Americans who come to your restaurant and they'll say, can you pack this stuff for us? And I'll say, go home and experiment. They are, your, they are the greatest things which happened by nature to food. They're the fantastic. Right, it's like if you look back at uh, the explorers who came to India, they, they originally came in for the spices, right? So it's like that was and the Indian said, commodity. no problem. It is on the street. Pick up the black pepper. <laughs> it's like, really? It's like black gold. <laughs> it's more expensive. And in India, it grows everywhere. It's, I yeah. think it's also, in the book, I do mention that, about the fertility of soil, the, the placement of the country. Imagine a country which wears the crown of Himalayas. Himalayas. Teresa <laughs> one, right? <laughs> Him Himalayas. So imagine a country which has a crown of the mountains, the grandeur of them, just to protect the soil, literally. So I was reading this article by this American person who was researching on Indian soil, said that, that it's amazing that how much it's covered with water on all the sides. And on top, it has these grand mountains. It has every possible climate in the world, which makes the soil so fertile. So even when you look at Janoon, the only colors which you'll see in the restaurant are the, the palette of soils from India. It's so 
it's so amazing that I collect soils from different regions of the country and they all look different, they behave different, they grow different spices. Yeah. But a lot of people take it for mistake, no, a lot of people mistake, that's a big problem. Sometimes I have to remember the sentences so that they always write in <laughs> grammar. <laughs> Many people do not understand. This. Every time I repeat it, right. it's going to be the same. It's I've remembered this whole line. Every time you look at Indian, uh, uh, I'm going to say it in non language. <laughs> so every time you look at India, it's not just the soil which grows the spices. There are too many more factors. It's the sun, it's the rain, it's the waters, it's the climate, it's the season, it's the nurturing, it's also the manpower. Mm -hmm. But water is the most essential after sun. And then it's the soil is continuously changing. And a lot of spices, like black pepper, why it could not grow, why it was so prized, because I write in this book about it, I show it. That black pepper has this amazing natural phenomena, nature's precision, of being water pollinated. It's like, okay, what's the big deal, right? We would say. Water pollinated means that the first time the flower opens, it has the pollen, the water or the raindrop has to fall right on that point to take that pollen to the next flower. Imagine the precision of nature. Did I say it? Wow. Did I explain it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, English? That's great. So, and if it rains too much, you look at the leaves, they look like umbrellas of, water, of black pepper. It's crazy. And if it's windy, it does not work. You will not have the pollen at the exact spot. If it rains too hard, the water will not reach there. And the worst thing is, if it does not rain exactly at the same time, you will not have the pollination of black pepper. Oh, you can't do that with irrigation. <laughs> oh, I should be less passionate when I talk like this. It looks <laughs> like it's a personal risk for my whole life. If the water drop, man, it's like, oh, what's the big deal, man? Get over it. It's like, no, it's so, it's so. <laughs> Okay, I'll be right. normal now. It's, it's amazing, yeah, how, how much nature works to get And how much this. research goes into this. It's like, you're talking about, yeah, man, it's like, some of my chefs will say, chef, get over it. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> and I went to research on star anise in Vietnam last year, and it's crazy, the spices. Star anise also grows in Arunachal Pradesh, that's the northeastern parts of India. It is phenomena how this turns into the star anise, the beautiful piece of architecture by nature. That how much, how much processes it goes through. And again, it's not water pollinated. Okay, I, I will not talk about it again now. <laughs> I think we, yeah, everyone's here to see your passion about food and it's, it's great. <laughs> it's crazy that how nature has applied itself or it, it's so, and this is one of the books in which I say, you have to lead, read the last page first. Some of people would know that I host MasterChef India, which is like the biggest cooking show in India. So we shoot at RK Studios. It's in Mumbai, in a little bit outside the main city. So I have told the, the main guards that if somebody comes to meet me, you have to call me. So I go out and I see this woman sitting outside. She's, of course, begging on the street. But I see her trying to feed her daughter a small piece of bread. And she's telling her a story and making a little helicopter out of it. And it was so heavy for me to, and like, people are like, what's the big deal about that? So I got so inspired, I wrote a poem in my native language. Which is Punjabi. <laughs> right. And then the editors are banging their head, like, what is that? <laughs> but I have some good people I work with. So we did, we, I wrote a whole poetry about the cycle of nature that how that little piece of bread, which is swinging in the air, and both those imaginary stories and sparrows, what she's telling the story. Can I read, can I read that? Yeah, please, yes, please. You're going to say, this is like, <laughs> oh, this is not my glass. These are Rajesh's glasses. I, I must have fought, dropped them somewhere in the kitchen. So this is how I want the book to be read. So, it takes a million hands to feed a child. From the strong hands that plows to the precise hands that sow. From the loving hand that waters and waits for the sprout to grow. From the nibble hand that cleans to the rough hand that grinds. From the experienced hand that packs to the vendor's hand that binds. From the sturdy hand that kneads 
to the practiced hand that rolls, from the careful hand that begins to cook and nurtures our souls. And finally, to the loving wrinkled hand, which gently breaks away a little piece of bread and blows cold air to make it cool every day, and begins to tell the folklore of imaginary sparrows that flew afar, to the immortal heroes, angels, and fairies that live on a distant star, the mythical men who attained magical strength when they ate. She ran after the little princess everywhere, still holding the plate. Then a little mind that travels a distant journey and suddenly stops. A little morsel is eaten, completing the journey of divine crops. Even the god's mother also run, ran after them for this sacred chase. A new sun brings a new cycle of love, full of gratitude and grace. It takes a million hands to feed a child. Wow. It's brilliant, right? <laughs> that is great. And my college people said, if you don't pass in English, we're not going to get you admission. <laughs> this shows them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing poetry. But I think that became the source. It becomes a, a very humble source for you to write literature. It becomes yeah. a source of <clears throat> not making it look too large, not making it too glorified, not making it too glamorous, but to make it real and humble, to make it like the roots of a cuisine of an, such an old culture like India belongs to those little imaginary sparrows. I nice. think it was like, I mean, sometimes you read this to your, <laughs> I read this to my mother. <laughs> you must, I wish I had a camera to tape it. <laughs> and my mother was like, you remember those stories? <laughs> it's like, no, mom, I don't remember those stories. But, but that is how a culture is in continuation. That is how the stories pass on from one to the other. Right. It's, it becomes a part of you. And it's, when you're doing what we do here in America, we can't disconnect ourselves from the real truth, the real roots of the cuisine and the culture. Nice. Yeah. So that's where you get your inspiration for all the books. Simplicity. Like so it's not just your publisher pushing you to write two books every year. <laughs> He's looking at the publisher. <laughs> no, I, I write what I feel. I can't be scripted. I have a very big problem. See, I was scripted that line to talk about, even sometimes restaurant, I have to be scripted what to say. I can't say it. It becomes very hard for me to explain something which is organic and which is internal. It is not scripted. It can't be. Nice. So in the process of coming up with a book or a new dish, right? How, how do you weigh innovation versus tradition? As in, you know this formula, dish, and then how do you uh, make it more presentable? Amar, you think I believe in formulas? Well, exactly. No, not, not formulas. But what your, what's your creative process like? Creative process is extremely simple. People try to make a very big deal out of it. It is not. It is not. It's just food. And you know, I said something which was like a little bit off the, should be off the records actually. <laughs> it's like, it's when people are having dinner and say, this is one of the best meals of my life, people tell you are Janoon. So I always interrupt and say that food doesn't matter. Food doesn't matter. It's the people you're having dinner with. That's true. Food. Well, <laughs> it was off the record. <laughs> but it's. <laughs> <laughs> it's it like really like how much work goes into it. I said, we are just the backdrop. We are just the furniture. I, I'm not talking about the chair. I'm talking about you. No. Food is the backdrop. It's the people. It's that energy. It's that moment. Restaurants will come and restaurants will go. It's such a transient world. There was something before Janoon. There's something after Janoon. That's the truth. I'm a big follower of the Dalai Lama. That's why I say that. But it's that moment that you spend there in that restaurant and said, do you remember my 21st birthday when the chef actually got the cake out? Do you remember that moment when we had that dinner? You remember? Oh my God, I miss my grandmother. Remember the last meal we had with her? It was at Janoon. So my <clears throat> publisher, because of whom this book is there, Mr. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned the Dalai Lama, right? Yeah. Um, you wrote a book about him yeah. on his 80th birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was it called? 
time was legacy. Oh my God, it was such an amazing experience. I made a cake for him. I'm not going to get too excited. I'm going to see it normally. <laughs> I made a cake for him from his native breads from his hometown. I lived in Tibet. So I, I can make like almost 16, 16 different breads of Tibetan culture, totally different. So I made this bread, I made it very thin and I made like layers of cake. So I wanted to get 80 layers in that one cake. So 80 years. I couldn't do that because it was becoming like this big. So <laughs> I'm wondering how it's going to cut it now. <laughs> so I made only like almost like 14 layers. So and I took take it to him. You, you'll be surprised when you hear this. So I put 80 candles on him and I said, His Holiness, it's your 80th birthday and I want to, you to cut this. So I'm sitting there and I'm waiting like him that he's going to blow the candles. So I said, I'm like, you know, you don't tell, instruct people like of that status that blow the candles, make a wish. <laughs> So, and, and he's there, and, and it's, it's, it's one of the very powerful moments. So candles are burning, and he starts taking the candles and starts putting them on the side. Wow. So I'm like, I just looked at him, I said, did you make a wish? He's saying, in my culture, you don't cut somebody's life off to wish for your longer life. I can't cut the life of this candle so that I can wish for my long life. I thought... How did he think about this? Like, I wouldn't even, we don't even care that you just cut the life of that candle. It was amazing. And what was the greatest part was on our social media, <clears throat> I post a lot of stuff. Every day, one wrong English, I put something. Yeah, just <laughs> to plug in, we, you, you should all follow him on social media. He's, he's great. Vikas <laughs> Khanna. <laughs> I'm not promoting that, but then I'll have somebody, Jay or somebody, say, you should consult with us or when you write, it's totally wrong English. It's like, <laughs> and then you'll say, okay, people liked it for what? <laughs> so I put it on social media that I'm meeting His Holiness on his 80th birthday and I want you to ask any question to him. So there's going to be 80 questions. You will be amazed by the amount of questions we got. And my favorite question was, do you ever wear jeans? <laughs> a little kid asked from school, and you know, American kids can be so, they, have, they can think so openly, it's so amazing. And he asked that, do you ever wear jeans? So I asked His Holiness, the first question was, do you have a driver's license? And he says, no. I said, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how to react to that. But he said, and then I asked him, do you ever wear jeans? He says that, uh, and he just kept quiet. I said, is that yes or is that no? Because I'm writing it kind of. I was behaving like an Oprah moment for my life. <laughs> and he said that I wore pants one time and he had to leave Tibet. He had, he had to be disguised. And he said that when I reached the Indian borders, so there was a Sikh guy who was standing there and I was wearing a pant. That's all I remember. And I left my country that day. I'm like, oh my God, this man is like, brilliant and I love him not because he says about religion he talks about something that you don't need religion if you educate women I love that he's such and he loves uh, scientists yeah more than anything else he's thinking I love scientists because they give you facts they don't misguide you they're trying to find the research of the true cycle of nature and I'm like I'm your big fan can I tell you that but I was really starstruck talking to him and he didn't understand my English neither did I understand his English, so it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some say he's like an eight-year-old in an 80-year-old body. He is beautiful. And there was one sentence I asked him about was that, about mother. And it was like, and the photographer, I told him, don't click picture at this time, because both of us were almost on the verge of crying. And He's saying that's, the, that's from where a child gets the compassion from. That's as sacred as the soil. And here it is. It's beautiful. So you, your mother, your grandmother, you've mentioned that they are big influences in your life, right? You learn cooking from your grandmother. So how was it like growing up in India? Like, did you have a garden? Or you had a house? small piece of back house, back of the house, a small strip of soil in which we would, I would try to think that I'm going to be a farmer when I grow up. So I'll try to grow everything there. And we had a small container, a brass container. A lot of Indians of my generation will relate to that. You people are 
three, four generations younger than me, but <laughs> <laughs> there was a small container of cardamom, and I loved cardamom, but cardamom will not be used in food. I know that's a very strong comment, because it was very expensive. So only when the son-in-law will be coming home, <laughs> the rice pudding will be made with one cardamom, <laughs> and somehow it just lands up on his bowl, <laughs> right on top of his bowl. And I'm like waiting for, I said, and they didn't care about cardamom, and I'm the one who's watching it. So I'll try to steal it after they finished, and I'll try to go and sow it in the soil in the back of my garden, expecting that one day I'm going to have a cardamom tree. See, we were born in non-Google, what are we in Google office. We were born in non-Google world, so we didn't know how cardamom plant looked like. Now you can ask Google anything, you know, it's like, that time I didn't know how cardamom grew and how it happened. So I write a story here in this book, it says, will cardamom grow? And it is the honest truth about nature is that, right, it says that will cardamom grow? And I write about that it never grew. I will come back running from school searching that I will have a cardamom plant, it never grew. So my garden was as failure as me. Nothing grew there. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people But I would pretend, I would pretend. We had a tomatoes one time, I'll never forget, we had a tomato, and we got so excited, me and sister, we kept touching it that it fell down. So it actually never grew. <laughs> Your excitement came. It's like the homemade ice cream, you know? <laughs> homemade ice cream never freezes because every child wants to go in the freezer and check if it's ready. So eventually you drink, get to drink that. It's like you, it's like same thing when, when people like us, when we try to do farming and we have one crop coming out, we are all touching that crop all the time that it dies. It's like, guys, leave me alone. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so uh, tell us something about how you started off as... Uh, before Junoon, your, like, your career as a restauranter, like things that worked out, things that did not, I find those things very inspiring. You have a great story. I'm still work in progress. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's OK. This country was based on resilience. This country teaches you something which is called mm -hmm. not giving up. And failure is OK, not a big deal. I've been a failure all my life, so it's like, it didn't even affect me when we close, used to close a restaurant. It's like, okay. But one thing would always hurt you, that, that little thing back when somebody told you that you can't do it, you somehow felt that you lost to yourself. That's a big defeat. And one day, <clears throat> we kept working. I was working in this restaurant called Spice Root or Tandoor Palace on Fulton Street. I get a call from the producers of Gordon Ramsay. And they said, we want you on the show. And uh, I go there, and it was an amazing experience. Everything I spoke in English was translated in English. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, great. What language were you talking? I said, I was also trying to speak English. But <laughs> so I said, we are in the middle of Manhattan, and we can do it here. And it was written, we are in the middle of Manhattan, <laughs> and we can do it here. So, so I'm like, oh god, this is amazing. I told my dad, I'm doing, I did a show with Gordon Ramsay, and he says he speaks Punjabi. And I was like, no, I did a show in English. He's like, you can speak English. He's like, kind of. I'm, I'm working very hard to learn. But later you realize that communication, failure, everything is not important. It's a matter of heart. Just to f I'm starting a very good museum in India about Indian dishes and utensils and how, you know? Because India has everything from the Portuguese to Dutch to French to Mughals to native Indian and to tribal. There's so many dishes. So much of India is infinity. So last week, there was a big shipment of my plates. It, I'm obsessed. Janoon is the right name. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have that. It's like so many plates which went to the, to the college where we are doing this museum. They all broke. All these plates. Hundreds of years old plates. Oh. Everything crushed. So I called Rajesh in the middle of the night, freaking out. <laughs> all the plates. And he's like, what, did you take insurance on the delivery? I said, no, I didn't ask for that. He's saying. So later I realized when I, when I hung up the phone with him, I'd totally was in fit for some time. It was like I gave a piece of my life to something and it just crashed. And nobody would witness that piece of history, what I had, hand-painted work and 
amazing, one of the first plates which must be literally created in India in, by some of the immigrants and everything, the Jewish plates. And the, we had a place, the Passover plate I had, which was on the oldest Passover plate. India has the oldest living Jews. They were one of the first immigrants to India. Their plates, everybody who trusted me with their heritage and gave it to me, I broke. And later I wrote a message to my principal saying that they were just plates. Life is actually the matter of heart, as long as the heart doesn't break. So even if you fail, it's OK, as long as your heart doesn't break. Breaking of the heart is a big deal. I'm not saying it as a chef or an emotional Indian. I'm saying it as an honest person who says that sometimes it's that unbroken heart which makes you go on and on. And you don't see night, you don't see 24 hours. My watch doesn't work, which a lot of people know that, <laughs> who work with me. It's always 12.15. <laughs> it's always 12.15. That's the time I've landed in New York. It's a, it's a matter of heart. Well, thank you. Very inspiring. Failure is good. <laughs> Poverty teaches you a lot. There's nothing more which you're taught in colleges and everything than poverty. Poverty turned me into a photographer. I took most of the pictures myself because it was so expensive to get photographers on board and to be cooking at their pace. And they're like, man, we are getting late. Eight hours are going to get over. The food is not ready. And you rushed the food, and the food burnt. So you learned how to take pictures. But that extended forward. You couldn't afford editors. You started writing yourself. And then you met somebody so fantastic like Hiroko from Lake Isle Press, and she said that everybody can write English, but not everybody can tell a story. So it's all good, as long as the heart doesn't break. Nice. Right. Next question. I don't know how to follow up on that. <laughs> See, I have remembered the answers. Whatever question you ask doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm going to give the answer what I've remembered, what I've memorized. <laughs> Uh, you you work with Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. You've been on Martha Stewart, yeah. Bobby Flay, uh, and now you're a uh, uh, judge on Master Chef India, yeah. right? I host many shows. Yeah. So uh, and also one more travel twist, twist of taste. So how is that TV experience, the glamour life? Uh? Oh, TV is very funny. TV is really funny. TV doesn't. TV has its own uh, brain. Camera has its own brain. So when I go for the first time for audition of MasterChef India, they were like, is he really coming from America? It's like, he doesn't have an accent. <laughs> we thought he'll be. <laughs> so, and my Hindi is also not pure Hindi. It's Punjabi. And I think I'm speaking Hindi. This happens to everybody in my family. So, and it was funny that uh, you had to really work very hard, very hard to make sure what you're trying to explain within that duration of time that you explained. And so many times I'll get excited, I wouldn't be able to explain. And my director will, OK, we'll take a retake. It's OK. Don't get too excited. So <laughs> TV is fantastic, because TV gives you retakes. Sometimes life doesn't give you retakes. Yeah. TV gives you retakes. And one thing which I hate about time is that sometimes doing big projects, it's, it's, it's very sad. TV for me, MasterChef for me, is not just a show. It's something which is very much bigger than that. People. I can't even explain it. It's like for me, homecoming. Homecoming is big. It could be for birds or animals or humans for anyone. I lived in America for almost eight years, and I get this opportunity to step back to my country. And not that I was doing well there. I couldn't deliver what they wanted. And I left the show. And I told my mom, I called her around 11, 13 the night. I said, Mom, I'm going back to America. It, this is never going to work for me. She says, you know, this is the first time your homeland has asked you for something. There are a lot of kids who are waiting to hear your story. Don't give up. I said, OK. That's all I wanted to hear. I told the driver, get back to the hotel. <laughs> so I go back to the hotel. I practice a lot what I have to do, whatever I have to speak in the, to be clear in small sentences. That's a problem from where I come from. Our sentences are too long. And there's no comma and full <laughs> stop. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so TV is, TV is amazing. TV is a culture. TV is like a religion. TV has an impact. Mm -hmm. TV can inspire you. TV can, TV, can, TV can do a lot of stuff to your next generation, to that next generation of Michelin star chefs who are getting ready in small villages and small towns, small kitchens, small homes, without any resources. 
TV gives them hope. I see. Yeah, they can see your story. TV, they're all getting ready to hold the next flag. Um, so yeah, we have mics around the room for audience questions. You know, if you have, uh, if you want tips on cooking or something, <laughs> uh, ask away. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Um, so uh, I have a friend who's trying to teach me uh, how to cook various Indian dishes because uh, her daughter isn't interested in learning how to cook. So I'm like her surrogate daughter for that. <laughs> and. <laughs> I'm having a really hard time because she doesn't <coughs> measure anything. She's yeah. just like, you just know when it's right. When it's right, it's right. So <coughs> what tips would you, would you give someone? My grandmother would say that if you measure, um, barkat, what is barkat in English? Anybody knows Hindi? Prosperity. prosperity. If you measure, it reduces the prosperity of that dish. Oh. So she, she would not measure. She's thinking it's infinity. What? Infinity? Infinity? Salt? Can I put that in a book? <laughs> you need to have infinity oil. Okay, that, that's a very big problem. I know that. But the problem is that their cooking is always consistent, and we are always measuring and still not consistent. Mine just, it doesn't come out like hers. You've got to remember two things. Whole spices first. Okay. Ground spices later. Okay. A lot of Americans whom I teach Indian food, when you're heating oil, you've got to put the whole spices. That is how the base of the cuisine are. You're actually, what you're doing, scientifically, you are, again, this has been memorized. <laughs> <laughs> you're heating the oil. When you add the whole spices, you're infusing the oil with those flavors of the spices, which have their own natural oils. I can say that 100 times. It will be the same line. <laughs> <laughs> but that is one mistake which people take. When you add powders in the beginning of the cooking process, you might think that that might work. But when powders burn, they become extremely bitter. That would explain a lot. Actually. That will explain why. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. So um, there's no record. I have a quick question. Like um, sometimes we try to cook as um, like nine to five working people, but when we go to home to cook dinner and it's like um, eight p.m., um, there isn't much we can cook from and we cannot we, I can steam broccoli but I cannot cook like <laughs> a, a full Indian tarka um, al, alu gobi or like rajma or something because it takes time to first put the whole spices into the oil first put the oil warm it up whole spices onions then bring the tarka in then put the veggie vegetables and the whole process kind of takes about one hour so is there like uh, something um, I tried to um, uh, buy pre-made uh, spices, um, pre-made gravies, and then put them that into the oil. But it doesn't smell that well as the fresh uh, spices, whole spices into the oil smell. So <laughs> is there a trick? Uh, the, how do I'm always amazed. Like, how I'm do restaurants do I'm telling you, the that? biggest problem is a lot of Indian women. They have they have attained such great standards of Indian food that sometimes it's hard for us to beat that. I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm, I'm being honest. <laughs> they make the simplest potatoes taste like heaven. And then they seem to be so without any effort. The food is ready. It is sitting on the table. So they got and the bread magically comes fully puffed up. OK. They have raised the standard of Indian cooking so high that <laughs> nothing. Then they have destroyed us. They're not helping us anymore. <laughs> in a very good way. You're so right in some ways that when we go back home, I don't want to think about making all these infusions. I don't want to do all that stuff. I agree on that. But if you read this book. <laughs> <laughs> Plug in for the book. <laughs> no. You'll be surprised at how easy it is. You steam the broccoli, right? How much time do you steam it for? Three to four minutes? Yeah. Maximum five minutes, thinking of how hard it is or how fresh it is, right? I can do that broccoli for you in less than three minutes. Okay, you need to heat the oil, add some cumin, add whatever spices you want to add to it. Be creative. You just toss in the broccoli, you just toss it. It has to be crunchy. It takes lesser time. One of my editors, she was vegetarian. She got really inspired, and she would only eat boiled vegetables. And later she told me, she's thinking, you know, I'm not feeling too good about this, because you know why? Because when you don't add spices to it, you need the heat for metabolism. So that comes from those little spices, which are actually part of such a medicinal chain of Ayurveda. 
it just would not take so much time. We make a very big deal out of it to attain supremacy, which we're not, but. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Did it, was it really an answer? <laughs> <laughs> it is not so hard. You need to keep that spice box, which is in every Indian home. You fill it up. <laughs> it comes out magically on the table. You heat the oil through anything you want. <laughs> Food is your expression. And whatever vegetables you have. In America, it's so, I think it's much easier to cook here because of the convenience of, you can get everything pre-cut, pre-set, pre-prepared. So much is, it's so easy. There's no reason not to have great food here or anywhere in the world. I don't know if it's that simple. I've like, I've had experiences <laughs> where, sorry. <laughs> well, you make it sound Amor, so simple. you were supposed to be on my side. You know? <laughs> <laughs> There have been cases where, like, I'm on, you know, video call with my mom, and I'm like, "How do you make this dish?" And that then she's amazing. right there. And that's then... amazing. See, it is not about that dish. <laughs> that you can learn from a YouTube video. It is about that FaceTime. Yeah, that's what people don't understand. It's about that FaceTime, and she feeling so fantastic that somehow she feels that she's nurturing you. It is amazing for her. Yeah. She's thousands of miles away. At that time, she's going to call all her relatives, and all the mothers are the same. I'm not stereotyping them. She'll call, oh, today I taught him how to make that. You know, He must be missing home. That is why. I gave him all the tips. Right? She's called 40 people after that. That's amazing. Do that, even if you know how to make a dish. Just call home and say, I miss those little, what you used to make, those kidney beans. 80% of the things you will not understand, because she doesn't know how to tell a recipe. <laughs> and somehow it will start with a conversation of the recipe. Oh, you know that aunt came over that day? <laughs> She's not looking too good. Not but she kept asking that, well, when is Vikas going to get married? But you know, I said, mom, that thing we were talking about, but it's fantastic. It's therapeutic. <laughs> and you'll be surprised at how food keeps a whole culture of going to psychiatrists away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not against that culture. I go to psychiatrists. See, I'm obsessed, passion. But <laughs> I don't, but they keep you so, it's so fantastic that you have that link. It's amazing. And the day that link goes away, you don't care for food, you don't care for anything. You can buy everything. You guys are doing so fantastic, but you can't buy time. So give them that time. Call them for unnecessary tips. <laughs> so mom, how do you boil the water? She'll be very happy <laughs> telling you a half an hour story on how to boil the water. <laughs> Yeah. It's not the food. Hi. Hi. Um, so one of the issues that I personally have in the kitchen is that I find myself sort of settling into a very comfortable routine of the 15 dishes, 10 or 15 dishes that Everyone I Everyone is make. like that. Um, yeah, but also I think I've gotten my husband very used to those, so it, it becomes hard to justify experimenting <laughs> almost. So I wanted to ask you, how do you get into this culture of trying, you know, experimenting <coughs> Indian cuisine and putting new dishes together, combining like American dishes and Indian dishes. Like, how do you start moving I'll that direction? I'll just step back for one minute. It is cooking. When we talk about when we divide cooking by cultures, you will be surprised to notice that there's not much difference. It's the techniques. You learn the tech. If you once you figure out that I figured out that technique works perfectly. If you know that I can make this lamb absolutely succulent, absolutely perfect, and I figured out the technique. Now, you have the full control. You can add chilies and a lot of cilantro to it. You can make it Mexican style. You can make it Indian style. You can make it European style. It is that little technique of getting that chicken right to that temperature. It is that simple. It is that simple. And I'm not plugging in the book in this. I'm just telling you. <laughs> it is that simple. It is just understanding that, yes, I figured out, the day before yesterday, I was hosting a class, and they asked me one question. How do you make perfect basmati rice? I said, if you have a recorder on your phone, you record me. And I'll give you exactly in 60 seconds how to make bas perfect basmati rice every time. You soak the rice for 20 minutes. You heat the oil. Add any spices you want in it, right? You drain the water, rinse, rinse the rice, and put it into it. You've got to put double the water and cook it exactly for 10 minutes. You will see that all the water has been absorbed, almost. You take a kitchen towel, you wet it, you put it right on the rice, 
put the lid over it, reduce it to minimum heat, and cook it exactly for five minutes. And then I'll be pretending that I'm Mother Jaffrey, I'm a big fan of hers. You take a fork and you lightly fluff the rice. <laughs> See, it is that. Now, how do I make that rice into something different of different cultures? You have the technique in your hand. You knew exactly how to control that rice to that perfect grain to grain rice. You add the flavors you want. You want to add chipotle chilies to it? Fantastic. You want to add spinach to it? Amazing. You can now do all the variations because you got hold of the technique. Don't get hold of the dish, get hold of the technique. Sorry. That's awesome. It was a long answer. <laughs> so, uh, a question for you. Uh, you've cooked for heads of state, President Obama, you did a fundraiser for him. Uh, when Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he was here, uh, you cooked food for him as well. So uh, how, how do you like, do they just call you and like, hey, Vikas, can you, you know, they, Modi's they have in an town. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a long planning. It's a, there's a lot of trail work in it. There's a lot of planning which goes into it. No pressure, you're just cooking for Mr. Modi. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. And it was funny that I'm cooking for this, and somebody's asking me, Chef, it's a trillion dollar club. It's a four trillion dollar people. You know how oh. many zeros are there? And I was putting <laughs> the armies push together. So I said, six, seven. And she kept looking at me, saying, You know, trillion dollars? I said, Yeah. And I'm like pretending that I'm like, five, four. I don't know how many zeros are in there. It's too big a number. The food would have more power than all of them. They could be trillion in the trillion dollar club. They still need that comfort of food. Nice. So, is there someone like from the Secret Service standing on your shoulder ah, and looking at like, what you put? <laughs> ah, too much time. supervision. Too much supervision. They taste every dish which goes out. So, I was not doing it. I was not dealing with them because you know I was high mode. So, I put uh, Rajesh was doing that. Secret Service. He was there. I was not dealing with it at all. I was telling him to deal with them because it was like too much of no. That sauce you didn't make us taste. It's like, oh yeah, that's a little garnish which goes inside. There's three different sauces on the garnish, and they're like pearls on the side. Oh, we didn't taste those little pearls. It's like, okay, bring the plate back. <laughs> so I was not dealing with that, but it it happens. It's fantastic. These are the people who are inspiring the world. Who are the world leaders? So much of world economies are based on their. Yeah. So, and to get the opportunity to cook for them. And you know, this is the only thing you know and you represent the whole nation with that few dishes. And you got to do full justice to it. That's great. It's, it's all transient. <laughs> Comes back to that theme. <laughs> it's all transient. Yeah, but uh, you know, I was um, Da Vinci. He never completed Mona Lisa. Did you know that? You can Google. <laughs> you can Google it. That Mona Lisa was never completed. It was always an incomplete painting. And so is Janoon. Nice. And you're about to open it. I did everything in my power to get my grandmother there once to complete the restaurant. But maybe that's why it was a masterpiece, because it was never complete. I, did, I, I begged every airline. She was 94. I begged everyone. I figured out, they said, she's too fragile. I just wanted her to step into the restaurant once, once, to make it complete. But that's our Mona Lisa. It's as beautiful as the world sees it, but only Da Vinci knew that it is incomplete. Wow. Next question. We're so glad to have you here, Vikas. I'm personally a big fan of you. I watch all the MasterChef shows, and I've been following that show a lot. Thank you for coming here and being so candid, so open, and being yourself. We're enjoying your talk. Um, the question I want to ask is, um, with your life always being on the roll with the food, I'm sure you're, like, you're always busy with the events with the food. How do you get time to cook for yourself? Or is there someone else who cooks for you? And, and one more question before I end is, I mean, in spite of being surrounded by food all the time, we see you in the best shape all the time. So how do you marry uh, food and fitness together? <laughs> there were a lot of hidden questions in that. <laughs> um, I just eat a bowl of dal every single night. I 
I sit on the same steps of Janoon. I eat the same dal every single night. While you're in the service, you tend to taste too much. Mm -hmm. And yes, I'm, I'm extremely disciplined when it comes to work. Some people who work with me, they are surprised at how come I can around the clock. I think it's an opportunity. I take it from where I was 20 years ago, sitting here. It's, it's really, I begin to believe in miracles after I'm here. But I think one thing which you said is about discipline. Discipline is extremely essential. People can't see it. But people who work with you can tell that, yes, you're always being there when it is required. You're always, you're always writing literature. My next work has taken me 12 years to write. 12 years. It's also by Bloomsbury. It took me 12, do you know how much is 12 years? It's. It's crazy. I shot the whole book maybe like four times. I was never happy. And today is a big day. It's Durga Puja. It's, we worship the power of mother. And it's fantastic that you got this opportunity. And I still remember one thing. When first time I met Rajesh, he said me one thing which is stuck in my mind. He's saying, whatever you do, it has to be the best. So whenever we are writing about anything, which is about discipline, Utsav is something which you'll be remembered for far after you're gone. To the next generation, to the next generation. Every Indian festival, ceremony, ritual, traditions, custom, of food from tribal to urban, to adopted, to immigrants, to Rosh Hashanah, to Diwali, to Hanukkah, to everything is in that book. I tried to bring that book. And you know, I gave it to President Clinton last week. And it is such a heavy book, and he hold it like this. I said, I want people to hold this book as they're holding their daughter for the first time. And it's like, can you hold your daughter first time? I remember holding my niece. It was like hard for me to believe that my extension. And first thing you do is you put it in close to your heart. I want people to hold Utsav like that. And he replied to me saying, Ut, this, Ut, India is not just a daughter, she's also the mother. She's taught us so many things about philosophy of life. Of course, it's a forever work in progress. But I, that motivates you. That motivates you. Beautiful. Can we get the recipe for that dal which you eat every day? Give me something else at this time. It's online, it's just simplest food in the night. Night you eat for yourself. That's a moment to eat for yourself. We have to close up. Yes, we are. So you can take one quick question. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just wondering, what other cuisines do you enjoy, and do you get inspiration from other cuisines for your cooking? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm not going to sing about the cuisines which you already know, but I'm going to sing about some of the greatest cuisine which I discovered in my lifetime was from Bhutan. Bhutan is a landlocked country which was not open to the world a few years ago. It is the, please Google it. <laughs> it is the most beautiful country you will ever find on this planet. And their cuisine has really, really inspired me. Just a few ingredients, that is how the great food should be. Just put together with so much of integrity and love. They say Bhutan is like the happiest place on earth, like people there are very, I had failed so badly that I want to run away. So I found Bhutan as a great place. <laughs> I had lost almost everything. So I go to Bhutan, and I really felt that I was literally born again. It's an amazing country. Even traveling in Tibet, not just Lhasa, but around Tibet, it is so beautiful. There are many worlds in this world, and beautiful ones. But yeah, besides that, a real answer would be I'm inspired by French, Spanish, Italian, Japanese. Chinese cuisine we all love. A lot of people don't know in America that Chinese cuisine is the favorite Indian cuisine. <laughs> because we made Chinese cuisine also art. We put everything as spices. <laughs> nice. Right. Yeah, we are out of time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in with Thank us. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.